One thing with patients in the ICU that's more common than what's thought and not very well understood is elevations in intra-abdominal pressure. More attention has been paid to it over the last couple of decades, but it's still something that is overlooked in many patients. Extreme elevations can have very deadly effects for patients, so I wanted to review over this here, starting with a robust discussion about what it is and the physiology that is important to it. All right, you guys, welcome back to another video lesson from ICU Advantage. My name is Eddie Watson, and my goal is to give you guys the confidence to succeed in the ICU by making these complex critical care subjects easy to understand. I truly hope that I'm able to do just that, and if I am, I do invite you to subscribe to the channel down below. When you do, make sure you hit that bell icon and select all notifications so you never miss out when I release a new lesson. As always, the notes for this lesson as well as all the previous videos are available exclusively to the YouTube and Patreon members. You can find links to join both of those down in the lesson description below. Also, don't forget to head over to icuadvantage.com or follow that link down in the lesson description to take a quiz on this lesson, test your knowledge while also being entered into a weekly gift card. As well as don't forget that you can help support this channel through the purchase of an ICU Advantage sticker. Uh, again, those are found at the website icuadvantage.com forward slash support link down in the description. All right, so getting into the lesson, let's start off talking about what is intra-abdominal pressure or IAP. So intra-abdominal pressure is the pressure that exists within our patient's abdominal cavity. Now this cavity forms a compartment in which the pressure inside can be influenced by the volume of fluids or organs within this compartment. So as you can see here, the cavity goes from the diaphragm to the pelvis and includes organs such as the stomach, liver, pancreas, kidneys, bladder, and intestines. Now in here, there's typically 50 to 75 ml of peritoneal fluid, which is used to help lubricate this tissue. It does also contain portions of the descending aorta, as well as the inferior vena cava, as well as both of their distal branches towards the legs. Now, because this is a closed compartment, if there are elevations in pressure, they're transmitted throughout the compartment equally and can have effects on various organs and blood vessels that are in there. Now, while the knowledge of intra-abdominal pressure really has been around for 150 years, the practical application of this knowledge, especially in the critical ill, has really just increased over the last couple decades. All right, so let's move on and talk about elevations in our intra-abdominal pressure. So our high end of normal for intra-abdominal pressure is going to be less than 12 millimeters of mercury. Now, as the pressure in this compartment rises and it sustains above 12, it's something that we consider intra-abdominal hypertension or IAH. And we can actually grade the degree of intra-abdominal hypertension based on the patient's intra-abdominal pressures. So we have grade 1, which is going to be 12 to 15 millimeters of mercury. We have grade 2, which is going to be 16 to 20 millimeters of mercury. We have grade 3, which is 21 to 25 millimeters of mercury. And then finally, we have grade 4, which is greater than 25 millimeters of mercury. Now, when we have our patient's pressure that's greater than 20, and there is the presence of pressure-induced organ dysfunction or failure, then it's something that we consider abdominal compartment syndrome, or ACS. Now, this organ dysfunction is much more common when our pressures are greater than 25, though, and this is a life-threatening situation, and it's actually believed to have as high of a 60 to 70% mortality. Because of more research and focus over the last couple of decades, on one hand, we've become much better at recognizing IAH and ACS in some patient populations, while on the other hand, in many other patients, it's still often overlooked. Now, physiological normal in adults is actually less than 5, and it's normal for the critically ill to see our numbers run anywhere from 5 to 7. And then patients that are post-abdominal surgery or for patients who are obese, we can actually see 10 to 15. This is something that can be expected for them. Now, if the pressure is greater than 20 and we don't have that organ dysfunction yet, these patients are considered to be high risk for ACS and something we definitely need to keep an eye on. Now, generally in the ICU, when we're measuring patients' intra-abdominal pressure, we're really focused on having a pressure that's less than 20. This is going to be for those biggest concerns, but we certainly can further optimize therapy for intra-abdominal hypertension and really try to get patients back into a more normal range. In cases where intra-abdominal hypertension is present, we do want to trend these measurements to ensure that our patient isn't worsening. 
All right, so now let's talk about the pathophysiology of all this. So intra-abdominal hypertension and abdominal compartment syndrome have very serious physiologic implications, and they're not just limited to the intra-abdominal organs. Elevations in our intra-abdominal pressure can lead to significant impairments of cardiac, pulmonary, renal, GI, hepatic, and central nervous system functioning. And patients who have prolonged untreated intra-abdominal hypertension commonly present with inadequate perfusion and end organ failure. So again, very serious consequences to this stuff, why we need to be aware of it, looking for it, and then doing everything that we can to try and bring those pressures back into more normal ranges. Now, understanding these pathophysiologic consequences of the elevated intra-abdominal pressure is really essential for recognizing that the patient is in IAH or ACS and effectively resuscitating these patients, and then ultimately preventing the development of the intra-abdominal pressure-induced end organ dysfunction or failure. All right, so at this point, let's go through system by system and talk about these different physiologic effects that we see. So first, let's talk about the cardiovascular system. So an elevated intra-abdominal pressure can lead to displacement of the diaphragm and ultimately increased intrathoracic pressure. Now, this increased intrathoracic pressure leads to decreased venous return and then thus leads to decreased cardiac output. I'm going to link to a lesson up above if you want to learn more about that. And we can actually see some reduction of cardiac output with intra-abdominal pressures as low as 10. Now, compounding positive pressure ventilation, and especially in cases where we have high PEEP or high pressure control settings, so like high P-high and APRV, that this can further increase our intrathoracic pressure. Volume resuscitation here, though, may actually have protective benefits. Now, in these patients, afterload or SVR is also going to be elevated, and this is going to be due to the compression of the aorta, systemic vasculature, as well as the pulmonary vasculature from that intrathoracic pressure. Now, this can be the direct result of direct compression of the aorta and some of those systemic vessels that are in that abdominal cavity, as well as, like I just mentioned, through that increased intrathoracic pressure, compressing the lung tissue, and then impacting the pulmonary vessels. And this elevated afterload can actually mask changes in cardiac output as the elevated SVR can overcome the decreased venous return, really keeping MAP relatively stable in those less severe cases of intra-abdominal hypertension. That said, the increased afterload can actually be detrimental to patients who have heart failure or other types of cardiac dysfunction. Now, on top of the aorta being compressed, we also have compression of the IVC. And so decreased venous return results from the compression of the IVC in this abdominal cavity, as well as from displacement of that diaphragm. This pressure on the femoral veins also leads to decreased blood flow and the potential for peripheral edema and high risk for DVTs. Now, interestingly, we do actually see paradoxical CVP and pulmonary artery occlusive pressure values. Now, given the compression on these vessels, the decreased venous return, and decreased cardiac output, we'd normally expect to see decreased CVP and PAOP. Now, with IAH and ACS, we can actually see an increase in these values due to this increased intrathoracic pressure, and this pressure that then contributes to these values that we get, which we would normally expect low, but because of this increased intrathoracic pressure is going to bring those values up. All right, so now let's move on and talk about the pulmonary system. As mentioned, the elevated intra-abdominal pressure leads to increases in intrathoracic pressure. This then leads to compression of lung tissue and pulmonary dysfunction, and this is something we can actually see with intra-abdominal pressures that are greater than 15. All of this can result in atelectasis, decreased gas exchange in the pulmonary capillary membrane, as well as increased intrapulmonary shunt. This also decreases pulmonary capillary blood flow, leading to decreased CO2 excretion and increased alveolar dead space. Along with this, we can also see increases in both the peak inspiratory pressure as well as the mean airway pressure from that compression of the lung tissue, as well as spontaneous tidal volumes are also going to be decreased, along with pulmonary pulmonary compliance. Ultimately, as a result of all of this, we can see hypoxemia and hypercarbia. So now on to the renal system. All right, so here we can see decreased blood flow, and this results from decreased cardiac output as well as the compression of the renal vessels. These are what's primarily responsible for this. As well as increases in both renal artery and vein pressure leads to blood shunting away from the renal cortex, reducing our glomerular and tubular function. 
And so for patients, we can often see oliguria when our pressures are greater than 15 and anuria when our pressures are greater than 30. We can also see increased urinal compression, which is going to limit flow, as well as we can also see direct renal tissue compression, both which are going to decrease overall function. Now, all of these physiologic changes here with the renal system are potentially reversible if the IAH or the ACS is recognized and reversed early enough. All right, so now let's move on to the gastrointestinal system. So the GI system is really the most sensitive to changes in intra-abdominal pressure. So once again, we have compression now of the mesenteric blood flow, and this is something that's noted with pressures even just greater than 10. Now compression of the mesenteric veins leads to venous hypertension and then ultimately intestinal edema. So this can be further exacerbated by large volume fluid resuscitation, so think greater than three liters, as well as disorders that result in capillary leak. All of this can lead to increased edema of the intestines, and then this swelling can also be quite profound, and since they account for the largest volume of the abdominal cavity, that this can further raise intra-abdominal pressure, leading to this feedback cycle further exacerbating the problem. Ultimately, this decreased perfusion can lead to ischemia, feeding intolerance, metabolic acidosis, and significantly increased mortality, as well as loss of the mucosal barrier from the ischemia can lead to to bacterial translocation and then ultimately put them at higher risk for sepsis. So now let's talk about the hepatic system. Again, as expected, the intra-abdominal hypertension leads to decreased blood flow for the hepatic artery, hepatic vein, as well as the portal vein. So this is a result of both hepatic tissue compression as well as the displacement of the diaphragm. Now, decreased blood flow from the vessel compression, as well as that decreased cardiac output, combined with that hepatic tissue compression, leads to reductions in hepatic microcirculation. So this can impact the functioning of the liver, as well as it can reduce the clearance of lactic acid. And so this is important to know if we're actually trending this as a marker of systemic hyperperfusion. And the early changes noted above are something that can also be seen with pressures that are as low as greater than 10. All right, now let's talk about the central nervous system. So cerebral perfusion is something that's also influenced by intra-abdominal pressure. And so the brain really consists of four compartments. We've got the brain tissue itself, the vessels, the bone that's there, as well as the cerebrospinal fluid or CSF. Any increases in pressure in one of the compartments is actually carried throughout the others. And so in cases where they have slow chronic increases, that these can actually be compensated for, but acute drastic rises can actually lead to significant rises in intracranial pressure. So elevations in intra-abdominal pressure as well as intrathoracic pressure both lead to increases in ICP, significant reductions in cerebral perfusion pressure, and really persist as long as intra-abdominal pressure is elevated. Now, causes for this elevation in ICP can really be attributed to decreased lumbar venous plexus blood flow, so this is going to increase CSF pressure, as well as increased PaCO2, so from the decreased pulmonary functioning, this is going to lead to increased cerebral blood flow, which is going to add to increasing intracranial pressure, and decreased cerebral venous outflow leads to increased vessel pressure, as well as potential for interstitial edema in the tissue. All of these factors together can lead to increases in intracranial pressure. All right, now let's talk about abdominal wall compliance. Now this is something that's commonly overlooked but can also play an important role in elevated intra-abdominal pressure. So visceral edema or enlargement as well as free intra-abdominal fluid can all increase abdominal cavity size and thus reduce the abdominal wall compliance. So edema secondary to shock and fluid resuscitation can also contribute here and this decrease in compliance allows less compensation for further increases in intra-abdominal pressure. Increased abdominal wall pressure can also lead to decreased blood flow in the skin and ultimately lead to poor wound healing. This could also be part of the reason for high rates of fascial dehiscence for abdominal wounds. All right, and the last thing I really want to talk about with the physiology is just the concept of abdominal perfusion pressure, or APP. So if you're familiar with cerebral perfusion pressure, then this is very much the same thing, just with abdominal pressure. Essentially, our abdominal perfusion pressure is equal to our mean arterial pressure minus our intra-abdominal pressure. 
and our goal is to have an APP that's greater than 50 to 60. And this is actually a strong predictor for visceral perfusion, as well as for endpoint and resuscitation for these patients, as well as this parameter has been shown to be a better predictor for mortality than just a MAP or intra-abdominal pressure alone. And so just as a quick review over all of the physiologic changes that we just discussed, here's a quick summary of these changes for reference. So here I have each of the major areas listed out, as well as listing the specific changes that we would expect to see with the elevated intra-abdominal pressure. All right, now finally, the last thing that I want to talk about in this lesson is going to be to discuss some of the causes of elevated intra-abdominal pressure. So there's many potential causes, and we can actually classify intra-abdominal hypertension or abdominal compartment syndrome in two different groups. And so first we have our primary IAH or ACS, and this is actually caused by direct abdominal pelvic injury or disease. So these causes frequently require early surgical or IR intervention, and some common causes here leading to primary IAH are abdominal trauma and surgery, bleeding, ruptured triple A's, retroperitoneal bleeds, as well as intestinal obstruction. And bleeding can actually lead to pretty rapid increases in intra-abdominal pressure. Now after that, we have our secondary IAH, and this really results from things that originate outside of the abdominal pelvic region. So some common causes here are pregnancy, ascites, ileus burns, intra-abdominal sepsis, large volume fluid resuscitation, things like that. Now for the various causes and risk factors, it really helps that we can kind of think of them in terms of how they contribute to this elevation in intra-abdominal pressure. So first we have things that actually decrease abdominal wall compliance. So things like abdominal surgery, trauma, burns that restrict the movement of the abdomen, as well as prone positioning, that these all can decrease that wall compliance, preventing that compensation for things that start to raise intra-abdominal pressure. Now next we have things that actually increase abdominal volume, and this can be further divided up in two more groups, first being increased intraluminal contents, and so here we're talking about our gastroparesis, our gastric distension, ileus, obstruction, and volvulus. All of these are going to lead to increases in that intra-abdominal volume, which in a closed compartment, especially if we have problems with our wall compliance, are going to lead to elevations in intra-abdominal pressure. Now the other subgroup here are going to be things that increase the intra-abdominal contents. So here think acute pancreatitis, a hemo or pneumoperitoneum, so if we have blood or air that gets into the abdomen, if we have some sort of intraperitoneal fluid collection, intra-abdominal infection or abscess, any intra-abdominal or retroperitoneal tumor, if the patient had a laparoscopy with excessive insufflation pressures, if they have liver dysfunction, cirrhosis with ascites, as well as peritoneal dialysis. All of these things would also be things that would be increasing volume of the abdominal cavity, leading to elevations in that abdominal pressure. Another concern is going to come from capillary leak. So if we have massive fluid resuscitation, so greater than 3 liters, hypotension and shock, they've got a positive fluid balance, polytransfusion, hypothermia, acidosis, as well as sepsis can all potentially lead to capillary leak, which will lead to more interstitial edema, increasing the volume within that abdominal cavity, leading to elevations in intra-abdominal pressure. And then finally, a last couple of things here that can also lead to increases in intra-abdominal pressure, things like mechanical ventilation. So that positive pressure ventilation, that's going to be increasing intrathoracic pressure, which can then also cause pressure being displaced down into the abdominal cavity. And so again, patients with high PEEP or high pressures are definitely going to exacerbate this. Things like pneumonia, ARDS, and as already mentioned, obesity, all of these are things that can also increase that intra-abdominal pressure. So that was a lot of information on the basics of intra-abdominal pressure, as well as when it comes to those elevations, the pathophysiologic consequences that result from that, and really the things that we're looking for and the concerns that we have when we see these pressures starting to rise. In the next lesson, I'm going to talk more about how we actually get these pressures, as well as the management that's in place for patients that have intra-abdominal hypertension or abdominal compartment syndrome. So I hope that you guys found this information useful. 
you did, please leave me a like on the video down below. Uh, it really helps YouTube know to show this video to other people out there, as well as leave me a comment down below. I love reading the comments that you guys leave, and I try to respond to as many people as I can. Make sure you subscribe to this channel if you haven't already, and a special shout out to the awesome YouTube and Patreon members out there. The support that you're willing to show me and this channel is truly appreciated, so thank you guys so very much. If you'd be interested in showing additional support for this channel, you can find links to both the YouTube and Patreon membership down below. Head on over there and check out some of the perks that you guys get for doing just that, as well as check out some of the links to other nursing gear, as well as some awesome t-shirt designs I have down there as well. Make sure you guys stay tuned for the next lesson that I release, otherwise, in the meantime, here's a couple awesome lessons I'm going to link to right here. As always, thank you guys so much for watching, have a great day.